Ladies and gentlemen, faculty, alumni, staff, and students of the Aachen University, welcome and greetings from Pakistan, and a very good evening to our colleagues in the United Kingdom. Assalamu alaikum. We welcome you all to the fifth session of the series at the Conversations. And today, it gives me great honor to introduce our speaker. He's Dr. Akash Deep, who happens to be the director of the Pediatric Intensive Care Unit at King's College Hospital, London, United Kingdom. He also chairs the critical care nephrology section at uh, the ESNIC and also is the chair for the scientific education committee at the Pediatric Intensive Care Society. You can send in your questions at pccmpark1 at gmail.com. Myself and my colleague, Dr. Urshiluz Rahman, shall be moderating the session and taking any questions at the end. Thank you once again for joining us, Dr. Akash. The floor is all yours. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Zak. Um, I think it, it's been a long pending visit to Pakistan. You know, you might know I, I wanted to come here in 2018, somehow didn't work out. I was to come this March and then the pandemic started. So, but here I am. Thank you so much for the invitation. And what I have been asked to do is to talk on AKI in critical ill child with COVID-19, clinical approach and management. So I mean, say since the pandemic started in 2019, December, we have had this pandemic spread to different parts of the world. We have had publications, we have had seminars, webinars, addressing various parts of, of this pandemic. We've, we've spoken about presentations, we've talk, spoken about, uh, you know, the cytokine storms. But I think what, what we have not um, been very good at is to speak about the involvement of the kidneys. So I thought in the next, um, uh, say, 35, 40 minutes, I'll, I'll talk on the evidence-based, uh, whatever evidence we have on COVID-19 and acute kidney injury in adults, touching upon the epidemiology and pathogenesis in both adults and pediatrics, and very briefly touch upon this novel condition, the PIMS-TS or the MISC, which the, with the US guys call it, and see what kidneys does in that condition, talk a bit about what future studies we are planning to conduct, and more, the majority of my talk will focus on renal replacement therapy special considerations. So what does one do when a pandemic sets in and a patient requires renal replacement? And in the end, I'll talk on two blood purification techniques, the total plasma exchange and the cytosolvent therapy. Now, just to set the stage, let's talk about acute kidney injury. In a, in a non-COVID or a COVID patient, the definition remains the same. It's an abrupt decrease of uh, it's an abrupt decrease of glomerular filtration rate occurring within 48 hours in a previously healthy subject or in a previously steady state chronic renal condition. Because it's acute kidney injury doesn't mean it just ends. It's a continuous disease when it occurs to recovery. It's called transient. If it recovers within 72 hours, it's called persistent when it's more than 72 hours, but less than seven days. And then we talk about acute kidney disease and, and chronic kidney disease. And it's diagnosed and staged according to the KDGO criteria, which as you all know, is based on a rise of serum creatinine above the baseline. And that baseline depends upon whether you have a previously, a, a child who has got a previous creatinine or we calculate it according to the charts for the age and for the height of the patient. It also depends on the urine, urine output decrease. So based on the critical criteria, we diagnose and we stage AKI. Oh. Right, now what we know is that, uh, that kidney involvement in COVID-19 is not yet very well studied. Coronavirus is a new disease, and we have unfortunately just seen the tip of the iceberg. And if you look at literature, I'm, you will see preprint papers, you see letters, you see announcements, you see reviews. So the published literature is exponential. What I'm talking to you today, next week, there might be more literature, there will be a further experience from another institute, and the evidence within a week or 10 days might become redundant. Now, talking about COVID-19 in children. This is a European study, 82 participating healthcare institutions, and they looked at the factors associated for the need for ICU admissions, and they also looked at the various clinical factors. And you can see that 582 in, uh, children, median age of five years, and about 25% of them had pre-existing medical conditions. And if you look at this cohort, 8% of these patients required ICU admissions, 
4% had mechanical ventilation with a median duration of mechanical ventilation being about seven days and 3% had inotropic support. 0.7% was the mortality rate. But again, if you look at it, this, this, uh, this manuscript does not talk about acute kidney injury at all. What it does tell us is if a patient is younger than a month, is male, has got signs and symptoms of low respiratory tract infection, and has got pre-existing medical conditions, these patients have got a higher chance to go in an intensive care unit. Now, now coming to acute kidney injury with COVID in adults. Now, this is a forest plot of, a, of various studies which have taken place, and you can see there's a whole range of incidences. The incidence range from as low as 0.01 here to as high as 22.2%. And, and, and these were the two authors which have actually shown the wide variations. So if you look at the NEGM paper, it's 0.01. If you look at the JAMA paper, it's 22.2%. And, and I think this incidences have to be taken with a pinch of salt because all these studies are retrospective analysis in an unexpected outbreak condition. People are busy. A lot of people have been redeployed, so data collection might be missing or there could be incomplete information. People have used different classification methods. And even if they've used Kedigo, very rarely have they commented on the staging of AKI. They, yes, they mentioned 22.2% of AKI, but how many of them were stage three? How many of them were stage two? That data is missing. And it's almost impossible from these various studies to say, why did they start RRT? What was the exact indication? What was the timing of initiation? So that becomes a problem. But of course, what we do know, it's a well-recognized factor of poor prognosis, whether it's a COVID situation, a non-COVID situation. And in a COVID scenario, there are five studies which have found a significant association with so-called kidney failure and death. And there was one paper which very, very nicely has said that it was a severe API stage two or higher KDGO, which was associated with a greater risk of mortality. Now, this is, I think, one of, one of the most uh, important papers which have come out in the adult world. About 5,500 patients admitted to New York hospitals, of which about 1,400 were admitted to the ICU. And in this group of patients, 36.6% developed acute kidney injury. Majority of them were stage one, 46.5%, followed by 22.4% stage two, and 31% stage three. And of the total cohort of, eight, of patients who were there, 14.3% required renal replacement therapy. And if you, if you see here, this is no AKI, stage one, stage two, and stage three. As you are going from no AKI to stage one through to stage three, the number of patients who have died, this is the, the purple blue box I'm, I'm, I'm showing, the number of patients who are dying increase. So higher the stage of AKI, higher is the mortality. And this graph shows that the majority of patients who had to present with AKI either present at admission or within the first 24 hours. So pre-PQ management is very important. Pre-PQ resuscitation, rehydration is very important. And this might play a role in the fact that most of the AKI in this group had presented at or peri-admission. Now, this is a very uh, unique finding, I would say, that that there was a correlation between the occurrence of AKI and the timing of intubation and timing of mechanical ventilation. You can see that there here is the timing of intubation and you have a peak incidence of AKI here. About 90% of patients who were mechanically ventilated developed AKI versus only about 22% of non-ventilated patients. 97% of patients requiring renal replacement therapy were on ventilators. And of the patients who required ventilation and who developed AKI, half of them had the onset of AKI within 24 hours of admission, and severe stages of AKI occurred in about 66% versus only 6.7% in non-ventilated patients. So in summary, what, what this study showed was AKI, particularly when it is severe, is a condition that takes place among patients with COVID-19 who also have got respiratory failure. Now, they say it's common, they say it's linked to the respiratory failure and is a rarely a severe disease among patients who did not require ventilation. And of course, further studies, it was just a retrospective observational study, probably we need to study this association more. Now coming to pathogenesis, 
why do children, why do adults who have got COVID develop AKI? Now there's a whole range of explanations. People have spoken about cytokine storm, damage due to the cytokines. People have spoken about the organ crosstalk. When your when your lungs are getting affected, you start somebody on uh, on on massive amounts of mechanical ventilation. Start somebody on ECMO. Lots of release of cytokines take place at that point in time as well. You then talk about the systemic effects. What virus can do? There are instances where you have seen the virus in the proximal tubules, and there's a direct virotoxic effect on the kidneys itself. Plus, we cannot undermine the importance of fluid balance. They, they come to you dehydrated. They have a febrile illness. They do not take fluids well. They have insulin sensible losses. Some of them present with diarrhea and vomiting, so they are dehydrated. On top of it, if they're going to a ward, what we have been taught is you need to keep the lungs dry. So we really hit them hard with diuretics. So all these things lead to a pre-renal component and can lead to acute kidney injury. Of course, there are other effects of rhabdomyolysis and the toxins and everything. So in summary, the pathogenesis can be explained by the fact that you have got direct viral effects, you have got indirect effects, as I said, of diarrheas and hypovolemias, and you have got a cytokine storm. And that is what, what lead more the levels of cytokines in your plasma and your blood, more is the multi-system involvement and more could be the association of AKI. So this is the direct viral toxic effects and this is showing that how hemodynamic effects can take place. Now let's talk about AKI in COVID-19 critically ill children. The first single center Spanish hospital, 11 patients, Seven of them were positive. AKI was not reported. The second study, it was a multicentral centric Spanish hospital, SPICUs again, and they have reported AKI in 16% of the critically ill children with a range of 13 to 21%, but none of them mentions about the requirement for CRRT. This is a study called the CAKE study, which was published in Pediatrics on June the 9th, and they have reported that 18% of their patients developed AKI and the requirement for CRRT was 6%. So you can see that the, dissolve, the disease is evolving, the evidence is evolving, and, and the, the evidence is actually sketchy. They also mentioned that children who have got comorbidities, whether they have got congenital heart or congenital renal conditions, or the renal transplant patients, they are at a higher risk of getting renal complications with symptomatic COVID-19. You resuscitate them aggressively with fluids, you can get volume overload. You do not resuscitate them, but they are dehydrated. So you need to have that balance of managing rehydration when they are dehydrated and preventing excessive fluid overload. Use what you use as your, as your cues are for managing the fluid responsiveness. Yes, you've given fluids. Is your patient being responsive to a fluid bolus? It does your patient require more fluid? And does your patient require restriction of fluids? And of course, this is the, the gold standard which we go, go by, the AWARE study published in NEGM by our group. And we say that the AKI incidence in critically ill pediatric patients, any stage AKI was about 27% and severe AKI was about 11.6%. And there was an increased risk of mortality when acute kidney injury, especially when the severe AKI set in. And the requirement for RRT in these patients was about 1.5 patients. Now, this is a paper from Great Ormond Street. It's a single center paper. They looked at acute kidney injury in COVID-19 patients. It was not specifically critically ill, but I'm going to subdivide it and show you what happened to critically ill patients. So 52 patients, all were COVID-19 positive, either by PCR or by antibody. They used the British Pediatric Nephrology Association criteria. 46% had, had renal dysfunction, which was defined as creatinine which was higher than the normal, but the upper limit of normal, but a lot, a, major, a lot of them did not reach the AKI staging criteria, and 26%, i.e. 15 patients of them developed AKI. Of the 52 patients, 37 patients were admitted to PICU, and 14 of them, so 38% developed AKI of the patients who were in PICU, or we can say that 93% of all AKI patients were critically ill. None of them required CRRT, and 14 on the of the 15 actually recovered to baseline when they left the hospital. If you look at look at the, the same paper, you can see that creatinine, which is 
higher but not enough to cause KD go stage one. Ten of them had it, and the remaining is distributed between API stage one, two, and three. And if you look at this, you can see that eGFR is very nicely coming down as the patient's day of uh, length of stay is increasing. And also, you can see that uh, so your creatinine is nicely coming down, and your eGFR is nicely going up. So the patients are improving as the days are passing. So this AKI doesn't seem to be persistent. It seems to be transient. But of course, only a short time follow up till the hospital discharge is done. We have not looked at these patients beyond that. And I'm sure this is the talk of the town everywhere. The PIMS-TS or the MISC, patients who can mimic Kawasaki disease or have or toxic shock syndrome, they come with hemodynamic instability. And, and this is a group which we very need, carefully need to look at because they've got lots and lots of inflammation going around. But what is the involvement of kidney in these patients? Again, we are not very sure. We know from lots of webinars and from our personal experience as well, which we, I'm going to show you next, which we published in the Lancet only, only about a few days back, a lot of them presented with gastrointestinal symptoms. For 60% of them had either abdominal pain or vomiting and diarrhea. Lots of them presented with my, uh, myocardial involvement and shock. And a lot of them had basically dehydration. All of these patients are basically have a prerequisite to develop, uh, develop acute kidney injury. So this was the pa paper I was talking about, intensive care admissions of children with pediatric inflammatory multisystem syndrome. And you can see as April is going in, this is the weekly distribution of these patients, the patients, number of patients are, are going up. It was an absolute kind of uh, shock for us when we were trying to look at these patients so often. And you can see that the cumulative number of patients is going up as the weeks are going by as well. And if you look at the inflammatory markers, look at the D-dimers, 4,000 was the median. If you look at the creatinine, that was high as well. A few of these patients were positive for PCR, but a few of them were also positive for, for immunoglobulins as well, for antibodies as well. So the question is, why do we think that this cohort of patients is at more risk for developing AKI as compared to the COVID-positive patients or COVID patients who are non-PIMS-TS? Again, I think these patients are very, very febrile. Their, their temperatures go up to 39, 40. Insensible losses are there. As I mentioned, about 50, 60 percent had presented with gastrointestinal intestinal, uh, uh, symptoms. And very importantly, because COVID pandemic was going on, they were not seeking medical help early. They were not presenting to the healthcare facilities often, which means that their renal, re renal hypoperfusion was going on because of dehydration and that affected as well. And as you saw, they have an inflammatory phenotype, high CRPs, high ferritins, high D-dimers. And we know that inflammation initiates and perpetuates AKI. So higher the degree of inflammation, more could be potentially the risk of AKI in these patients there's a people have measured IL-6 in these patients and there's a cytokine storm and very importantly they have got a hypercoagulated state they've got microthrombi and that microthrombi could be present in the renal vessels as well and we can all of course talk about the immune effects of the virus directly because these patients take if the antibodies are positive something has taken place two to three weeks before that could have uh, have, have exerted a or immunogenic effect on, on the kidneys. And of course, when we talk about Kawasaki, probably it is the inflammation in Kawasaki or the vasculitis of the vessels, which potentially can lead to AKI. So lots of reasons why patients who have PIMS-TS or MISC can have AKI. And if you look at the same paper I showed you uh, about from Great Ormond Street, you see actually of the 52 patients, 24 of them had PIMS-TS. And of the 15 patients with AKI, 11 of them had acute kidney injury. So 73% of all acute kidney injury patients in this patients had biochemical evidence of inflammation, probably telling us that inflammatory state leads to inflammation in lots of organs, including the kidneys. And as I said, none of the 52 children required RRT or had persistent AKI, probably were we doing the fluids and vasoactive therapy correctly because there was so much of hype about this syndrome whether people were entering in early and hitting them hard. And what we, what we do not know is what is the role of immunomodulatory drugs? What is the immune of steroids on the occurrence or, or the preservation of the kidneys after AKI has taken place?
So we have uh, written a comment on acute kidney injury and COVID-19 attention to inflammatory phenotype. This will be published in the Pediatric Infectious Disease Journal in October. So please have a look out for this. And as I just said, there is a need for multi-center trial and that's what we have done. A paper has gone to critical care medicine looking at acute kidney injury in PIMS-TS temporarily associated with a SARS-CoV-2 experience from experience from 15 pediatric uh, intensive care units across the United Kingdom. And you can see that this paper hopefully should be reviewed soon and we should hear back from the reviewer soon. So the open questions are, which patients who have healed from COVID-19 are at a risk for PIMS-TS? Is there any biomarker which we can look at, whether it's NGAL or anything else which can predict it? And what kind of renal or multi-organ failure follow-up is required for pediatric COVID PIMS-TS? Now, this is the ongoing study. I'm, I'm not sure whether, whether Aga Khan is a part of it, a study which is ongoing, looking at the pediatric API registry and the collaborative. First is a point prevalence study, which has just ended on the 30th of June. And now people will be asked to retrospectively fill the data for the last three to four months, looking at the API in their respective units. Now, coming to management, I think it's, there is no significant difference with non-COVID-19 children with API. The thing which one needs to remember, it's all about diagnosis, it's all about prevention, having a very, very low threshold to think. I am dealing here with a child who's come to me dehydrated. I'm dealing here with a child who potentially could be fluid overloaded. And I'm dealing here with a child who is really inflamed. All these things are, are risk factors for acute kidney injury. And we need to have a very low threshold to think about it. And when I say prevention, look at your nephrotoxic drugs. I mean, so why would we not look at them on everyday morning ward rounds and say, right, this patient is on three nephrotoxic agents. I don't think the patient requires three. Or if the patient has developed mild API or stage one API, immediately speak to your pharmacist and say, let's either take down the drugs which are not required or modify the dose. Of, of those nephrotoxins. And, and, and I'm sure you know that remdesivir in itself is a set of nephrotoxic drugs. So we just need to be careful about nephrotoxin exposure. We need to be careful about the fluid overload and monitor the fluid balance properly and use balanced fluids when the patients are dehydrated and use diuretics in overloaded patients. Now, what is the impact of immunomodulation? Very difficult to say. And when the trend of renal dysfunction is showing a rapid deterioration, timing of RRT at that point in time might be very handy. So if I have to conclude about COVID AKI, I can say it's, it has got a mild clinical course in children so far. Some children might have complicated admissions. There, there's a wide range of AKI occurrence in COVID-19 from zero to 38% and essentially supportive treatment, management of fluid balance, nephrotoxic exposure, very, very important and having a very low threshold to think that once kidneys get involved, we know that if they go on to require renal replacement, both of them are bad. And, and now coming to what we do in this, in this scenario, where they have guidelines and guidelines and guidelines coming out, you've got NICE guidelines, you've got American Society of Nephrology guidelines. There are lots of guidelines, but there is no mention of acute kidney injury in COVID-affected children. With PIMS-TS, things might change. And as I said, our paper might show you a different picture. But at the, at the moment, there are no guidelines to say what exactly to do in patients who are affected with COVID. But what we need to remember is if we have reached a point where you have done the conservative management, you have looked at acute kidney injury in, in the wake of fluids and nephrotoxins and, and diuretics, and you need to start renal replacement, these are the three basic principles. Protect yourself and your team using full personal protective equipment. Limit the exposure to healthcare professionals. And if you have to disinfect all the dialysis equipment, please do so as per your hospital policy or your CDC recommendations. And meticulously discard all disposable equipment as per the hospital policy as well. And one of the ways to limit exposure to your healthcare professionals is by using extended tubings. Set your CRRT machine outside the isolation room. 
so that the exposure to the patient is less. But of course, in children, sometimes it's not feasible because there's an attendant risk of more frequent clotting, is a decreased sensitivity of pressure alarms and inadvertent disconnections. So in children, the volume of machine, the priming volume may, might become very large and it might not be feasible, but if feasible and if doable, this is one of the ways to kind of limit the exposure to your healthcare professionals. Now, as I said, there are recommendations, there are guidelines, but what one needs to do when these, you're using an extra corporeal device, especially renal replacement therapies, please continue using whatever your institute is used to doing it. Listening to a webinar or uh, reading an article and going and changing everything in the, in the wake of a pandemic where everything is already very stressed and any last minute changes might create more chaos and more confusion. And of course, you just cannot, as I said, listen about, listen to cytosorbent therapy or total plasma exchange. You will have to train your medical and nursing staff in, in, the, in, the, in the course of a pandemic, I think that's a very wrong time to do it. So the message is please keep following your, your institution's protocol unless something is simple, your staff can be trained and that can make a difference to the outcomes. So the principles of providing renal replacement therapy is entirely resource-based. The principles of the indications of or the contraindications for the all go for a spin. Whatever you have, you need to use that meticulously and with a lot of knowledge. So two, two things, you might have adequate resources as children might have, or you have diverted everything to the adults. Adults have got a surge. They have come to you and said, guys, you've got six CRRT machines. We are running short. Can you give? You have given it, but next day you get a patient. Though there is only one pediatric patient requiring CRRT at that point in time, but you are in the same resource crunch as your adult colleagues. So what can, what can be missing? You can either miss, be short in your CRRT machines or infusion pumps, or you can have deficiency of consumables, the circuits, the filters, the dialysate and replacement fluids, and anticoagulants. And importantly, there might be even a shortage of staff with adequate expertise because you might have sent your nephrology colleagues or your dialysis colleagues to help the adult colleagues. So that can be an issue as well. Now, the first thing is, do you, what kind of renal replacement do we choose? Do we choose intermittent or do we choose continuous? The continuous modality, I think it's most of the PICU people are more used to using CRRT. So that remains the modality of default choice. And if things are not available and you have to go to intermittent, you have the options of standard intermittent, or you have an option of sustained low efficiency dialysis, which is called SLED, or prolonged intermittent renal replacement therapy using your standard machines. Now, peritoneal dialysis, people think it's only people who've got chronic diseases, etc. but acute peritoneal dialysis, I, I think that has been the saving grace for this pandemic. I can definitely talk about kings that we, once we started doing peritoneal dialysis, our dependence on CRRT rapidly came down and so was the experience of New York as well. Now, what happens or what do you do when you've got adequate resources? You have a patient who, who is COVID positive, who requires renal replacement. So is it different? And I think the principles of initiation, maintenance and termination of CRRT exactly remain the same as for a non-COVID patient. The first question you need to ask yourself is, why am I starting CRRT in this patient? And I think that's a question you ask even for a non-COVID patient, because if you know the indication why you are starting it, you will be in a position to stop it as well. You need to have a good vascular access, a good size access based on age, location in the right internal jugular. The reason I say specifically right internal jugular is because you might have to prone your patient and the access is easier to access, and there's no thinking and bends during that time. And the, if you are if you're using an ultrasound machine and the patient is already prone, and this site can easily be accessed, even to put in directly an access there as well. The difference between, I would say, COVID negative and a COVID positive patient who provides CRRT is the anticoagulation. Patients are prothrombotic. I'm gonna show you in a while, in, in a minute. You have to use an anticoagulant or, optimize your circuit factors to make sure that the circuits don't clot. And these anticoagulants can be administered systemically, regionally, or you can use a combination. So when do you start RRT? 
you need to make sure your patient is euvolemic. It's not how you have taken care of all the things which you can take care of before RRT because RRT comes with a lot of manpower use, a lot of resource use. So identify it early and make sure the volume status is good, make sure the nephrotoxins are taken care of. And if you are still becoming azotemic, if your electrolyte acid-based disturbances are there, your fluid overload is there, and you have gotten a cytokine storm with multi-organ failure, then it's the time to think and say to your team, guys, you've got no choice, you're gonna start CRRT. And as I said, in a pandemic, you might have to create your own thresholds in your institution to say, I'm gonna start CRRT in these conditions only when you have got a resource crunch. Early versus late, it has to be a balance between your risks and benefits. And if you take into account the availability of resources, you have to make sure that you are not getting overwhelmed because you want to start CRRT early. And we know delayed versus early initiation that there is no difference. But the question which gets asked is, does delaying RRT initiation with close patient monitoring lead to reduced use of RRT, saving health resources? This is a question which we don't know in COVID, but I am going to show you this paper which have just got released yesterday. It is the timing of initiation of renal replacement therapy in acute kidney injury by Sean Bagshaw from the Canadian group. And they had done a multinational randomized control study involving critically ill patients, 3,000 patients, half of them got early, which was within 12 hours after, after the patient met the eligibility criteria, and half of them were in the standard st strategy in which they waited till the conventional indications took place or till the acute kidney injury persisted for more than 72 hours, and the primary outcome was death from any cause. And it's a very busy slide, but the message here is that the mortality in both the groups accelerated versus the standard therapy was the same, 43.9 versus 43.7. But adverse effects were much higher in the early group versus the delayed group. And amongst the survivors at 90 days, there was a continued dependence on RRT in about 10% of the patients in early group versus only 6% in the standard group. The group concluded, and hopefully that will answer a lot of our questions in COVID or non-COVID, is that amongst critically ill patients with acute kidney injury, an accelerated renal replacement strategy was not associated with a lower risk of death at 90 days than a standard therapy. Now, what modality in CRRT do you choose? Do you choose convection? Do you choose diffusion? Do you choose a combination? If you just look at the theoretical part, cytokines can be removed more efficiently by convection, but do we use convection all the time? No, there is no evidence that convection is better than diffusion. So as I said, use what your unit is used to using. We are at King's CVVH unit. We would continue to use CVVH. Some units use CVVHD as a, as a matter of choice to, to stick to the modality which your hospital is used to. So as, as I said, do what your unit is used to doing and is good at doing. Now, this is what I was talking about, the prothrombotic state in COVID-19, so endothelial cell dysfunction and lots and lots of inflammation recruiting your IL-6 and TNFs is a cytokine storm, ultimately leading to thromboinflammation, the hypercoagulable state in these patients. And this is what you see. You can see a thrombus on the arterial side. You can get a thrombus on the venous side. And very importantly, you've got a microvascular thrombosis here as well. So lots and lots of thrombosis. And a number of these patients are either started on prophylactic infusions of unfractionated heparin, or people have used low molecular weight heparins as anticoagulation, which is prophylactic to prevent the embolic phenomenon. And if you look at, at the fiber thickness, it is about 0 0.09 millimeters, the filter fiber thickness. And if a thick blood, a prothrombotic blood is passing through these filter fibers, this is prone to get clotted. And hence, we need to be very, very careful about filter lives. And this is what happens. The blood is flowing through the filter. The ultrafiltrate is getting taken out here, and the hematocrit increases. And of course, your, your, your risk of thrombosis increases. And if you look at the filter fiber, here they're really, really small. So that is filter clotting, where the where your the lumen of your filter gets clotted. There is something called clogging, where it's not the, the, the lumen of the filter which gets blocked, it is the pores. It's the pores of the filters which get 
plot, this is the protein cake which gets formed inside the inside the filter fiber, and this is called clogging. So in clogging, the permeability and the ultrafiltration are impaired, whereas the flow remains intact, whereas when the membrane clots, it is the lumen of the filter which gets blocked and the flow is impaired. So you can look at your transmembrane pressures in your, in your membrane clogging, and you can look at your pre-filter drop in the membrane, the membrane is clotting. There's a high in incidence of both clogging and clotting in patients with COVID-19. And we were really stuck hard with this at King's as well, where our filters were really sometimes going off in four to six hours. And we had to design our own anticoagulation and non-anticoagulation plan as well. So why are we worried about filter clotting? The first thing is more the filter clotting, increased downtimes for treatment and more downtimes, less is your prescribed dose delivered and less efficacious is your treatment. In the setting of a COVID, it is increased exposure of the healthcare professionals to attend to alarms and change the fiber. So if you do a lot of troubleshooting, you increase the use of PPE and you're using already your constrained resources. And when the filters are in short supply, and they're clotting more and again, more and more, you're requiring these resources and hence you might not be able to offer CRRT to these patients who actually deserve it. So what do you do first? We need to concentrate on, 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 on the common things first, select a large catheter because it said that a well-functioning, appropriately sized catheter is the best anticoagulant. And if you insert it in the internal jugular, it sits in the right side of the heart, which is the largest reservoir of blood, and you can prevent the leakage, the bending, and the kinks as well. So make sure that you select a large appropriate size catheter which gets inserted in the internal jugular if that's a possible site. Set the blood flow rates which are higher than normal. If you're using CVVH, you can set your pre-dilutions which are higher than normal. You can use larger filters with the larger filter surface areas and keep the filtration low if you're using a CVVH D or DF modality. Now coming to anticoagulation, the various options. You can use heparin because that's the most commonly used anticoagulant. You can use regional citrate anticoagulation. You can use prostacycline. You can have a combination, or you can even use a low molecular weight heparin in these patients. You can give them systemically. When it's a systemic route, it can be intravenous or subcutaneous, or you can give it regionally, or you can combine the systemic and the regional route. Unfractionated heparin, very commonly used anticoagulant because we use it in a number of conditions. And as I said, these patients might already be on a systemic infusion of heparin and you're starting CRRT. You might not have to use an extra regional uh, heparin in these patients. But if patients are not on a systemic heparin infusion, you, you give a pre-filter bolus of unfractionated heparin at 20 units per kilo. You start an infusion of heparin at a dose of 20 to 30 units per kilo per hour. It's higher than what we normally use in non-COVID patients. You aim for an activated clotting time of 180 to 220 seconds. If your ACT is low and the filter is clotting, you increase the dose of unfractionated heparin by 10 to 20%. Of course, beware of the side effects of heparin. You can get bleeding, you can get heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, and there is heparin resistance and unpredictable complex pharmacokinetics of unfractionated heparin. This is, the, this is what the world of critical care nephrology resorted to in the, in the late 1990s and said, lots of complications due to heparin. Can we get an anticoagulant which has less heparin complications? People talked about citrate because when you add citrate to the blood, it will bind your free calcium. And less calcium is available for clotting, and hence it works as an anticoagulant. What's a normal dose? Your normal dose is 1.5 times the blood flow rate. For example, if your blood flow rate is 100 mils per minute, you, you start with citrate as 150 mils. Uh, and that's a, that's a dose in a non-COVID patient. But here in a COVID-19 scenario, because you, the filter is clotting more, you might require lesser ionized calcium in your, in your circuit. So instead of, instead of aiming for 0.3 to 0.5 of your ionized calcium in the circuit, you aim for a lower, uh, lower ionized calcium of 0.2 to 0.3. So citrate can work as a very good anticoagulant, but of course it has got its own side effects as well, which I'm going to come to a bit later. Now, if you are using uh, systemic unfractionated heparin or regional heparin, and you're using citrate as well, and things are not, you've changed from one to the other, things are not working, then you can combine the two. 
You could use unfractionated heparin as a systemic infusion, and you can, you can have a regional infusion into the pre-filter using a regional citrate anticoagulation. The, the usual starting dose of heparin is 10 units per kilo per hour, and regional citrates at the same dose as mentioned before. Now, citrate has got lots of electrolyte disturbances, but the most important thing is because you can get deranged liver function in COVID-19, you might get citrate accumulation, you might get citrate toxicity. So you just need to either decrease your blood flow or you can start the citrate at a lower dose than normal. But this thing, you need to be very, very careful about ionic calcium, patient's calcium, and maintaining all the electrolytes in the normal range. And so we've talked, spoken about citrate, we've spoken about heparin. So if, if things are not working well, there's something else which, as I said, in my, in my institute, process cycling is something we use very, very routinely. In fact, that is our anticoagulant of choice. It's an antiplatelet agent. It has, got, it has got a heparin sparing effect and therefore it acts as a very good anticoagulant if you give a regionally pre-filter into the circuit. This is our protocol. I'm very happy to share, uh, share with anyone later on. You start from two, four to eight nanograms per kilo per minute and it is going into the filter pre-filter. And if things are not improving still, what you could do use is you can have a three-way tap here. You have a heparin infusion here. You've got a prostacycline infusion here. And both of them through a three-way tap are actually going pre-filter. So this is an example of both the anticoagulants going regionally pre-filter into the circuit. And if you have a shortage of infusion pumps, for example. You might not have adequate infusion pumps like guys in St. Thomas's had, we had. And at that point in time, you need to be innovative and say, can I use low molecular weight heparin therapeutic doses? Whether it's an oxaparin, whether it's delta parin, you use them in the therapeutic dose and monitor your anti 10 a levels aiming for 0.35 to 0.45. Or some patients, some people have also used an exaparin infused pre-filter into the circuit to reduce the subcutaneous injection discomfort. Now, again, going for more innovation, you can use a combination of low molecular weight heparin subcutaneously, and you can have a regional citrate anticoagulation as well to optimize the filter life. So this is just a summary of my anticoagulation, which I think is very, very important in any patient who's hypercoagulable, like a patient who's got a cytokine storm and has got hypercoagulability, heparin infusion, bolus of 20, starting at 20 to 30 units per kilo per hour, maintaining ACTs between 180 to 220. While using citrate regional anticoagulation, you aim for a lower ionized calcium, 0.2 to 0.3, instead of the usual 0.3 to 0.4. You can combine your systemic heparin with your regional citrate. You can use process cycling alone, or you can combine the two, both going regionally. You can use low molecular weight heparin in case you don't have infusion pumps, or you can combine low molecular weight heparin with citrate. Now, when resources are limited and we don't have adequate CRRT machines, what do you do? Well, you look at alternatives. You look at what can I do best with the resources I have? Intermittent hemodialysis, you've got peritoneal dialysis. What you could do is if you have got CRRT machines but they're lesser in number, you can, you can increase your exchange rates from the normal 35 to 40 mils per kilo per hour to 60 mils per kilo per hour and give it over a shorter period of time, say eight hours instead of continuous 24 hours. So that way is you're using one machine but giving CRRT to three different patients in one day. So the same machine provides CRRT to more number of patients. You can rotate your machines even at 24 hours or when the filter clocks to minimize the use of filters. And if the child has got some urine output, you can give them a filter holiday as well. So this is a scenario where your CRRT machines are limited but your consumables are present. What happens when your consumables are not there? So you then do the opposite. You do lower exchange rates, start at 20 mils per kilo per hour in AKI patients and who, don't, who are not hypermetabolic. Now, we, we normally don't recommend it. Like what happened at King's was that we in pediatrics used Aquarius and our adult colleagues used Prismaflex from Baxter. The fluids from Baxter ran out. So we used Nikiso's fluid into Baxter machines. So that can be used as well. In extreme circumstances, hospitals did manufacture their own 
replacement fluid by mixing saline and dextrose with various concentrations of potassiums and solar bicarbs and calcium chlorides. But one needs to also understand here is that because it's a pandemic situation, you might not have adequate amounts of electrolytes to make your own fluids. We need to be careful about sterility and stability of the fluid we have prepared. And as I said, the biggest challenge is you might not have even the electrolytes to make your own fluids. So this is just a flow chart which I've adapted from, from Claudio Ronco's paper, where we have talked about when do you start CRRT, what do you need to prepare, how do you prescribe, how do you deliver, and what do you monitor. Again, I'm happy to share my slides you know, with, uh, with Dr. Sidra and she can pass it on to you, but this is a flow chart telling you very practical aspects of CRRT. Now, CRRT was intermittent hemodialysis. Intermittent hemodialysis, yes, can be used, but a lot of units don't have the basic infrastructure like your reverse osmosis unit set up in their ICUs to deliver intermittent hemodialysis. So we had to make our, one of our adult ICUs into an IHD unit by in an emergency setting up reverse osmosis there. Pick your staff, they don't have much experience in delivering intermittent hemodialysis is normally run by the nephrologist. Your intermittent hemodialysis requires one-to-one -one nurses uh, nursing to have more exposure to the to nursing staff and you use PPE more often. So even if patients are hemodynamically stable, I think the first choice would be CRRT because it can be used in, a, in an unstable patient and you don't have that, that kind of exposure which you have in intermittent hemodialysis. Now coming to peritoneal, peritoneal dialysis, resource-limited conditions, acute peritoneal dialysis absolutely can be and has been life-saving in our conditions. It requires less equipment, less consumables. It can be run either manually or using an automated dialyzer. And in COVID-19, it's the automated peritoneal dialyzer with a cycler, which we would prefer. And it, it, is, it seems to be an equally effective modality of rerun replacement as CRRT or IHT with its, with of course its limitations, which, which I'm gonna say. So this is peritoneal dialysis, non-COVID dose of 10 to 20 mils per kilo or 300 to 600 mils per meter square. You can actually double it if you want better salute clearers and have hypercatabolic patients. Your dwell time, which is normally 30 to 60 uh, minutes, can that be increased as well for better salute clearance? But you have to be careful because if you, in, leave your fluid more in your in your in, in the abdominal cavities that might actually push your abdomens up and, and exacerbate your respiratory failure and exacerbate your ARDS management as well. So you just need to be careful with that. The problems are you have to put a peritoneal dialysis catheter sometimes in the in, in a patients who are prone. So what people do is they actually wait till they're supine to put the catheter in the supine position and then prone the patient. You of course can get pericatheter leaks and kinks and lead to skin breakdown and pressure sores. You can get peritonitis blockage of catheters and there is unpredictable fluid removal as compared to CRRT. Now this was peritoneal dialysis and I'll come back and show you how per use, use of peritoneal dialysis completely revolutionized the way we started dealing patients with acute kidney injury at King's. Now this is what I, I spoke about. You had cytokine storm, you have inflammation, you've got endothelial activation leading to capillary leaks non cardiogenic pulmonary edema, and you've got pathological coagulation leading to microcirculatory clot. All of these things are a perfect setting for you to do total plasma exchange. 1.5 to two times the total plasma exchange can be done on three consecutive days, or you can do it alternate days as well. And this is an example of three patient, pediatric patients whose P load scores very nicely decreased by the use of total plasma exchange in the H1N1 uh, epidemic, which took place in 2009. So the, can you combine total plasma exchange and CRRT? Absolutely, yes. Some centers, they, do, they interrupt their CRRT and then do total plasma exchange, but sometimes what you can do is you can use the same vascular catheter and divert it. So this is a vascular catheter and you divert it. This is the in parallel CRRT with TPE, and this is in series. So, you know, as I said, we can, we can go into the details in, in, in another talk sometime, but you can use the same vascular catheter using two machines, one machine doing PPE, one machine doing CRRT, and that way you should be able to use CRRT as well. Now we are very fortunate in kids that we didn't have to use the ethical framework to say, I have got 20 
children waiting. I've got five ventilators or I've got five RRTs to be done. I've got only two machines. We didn't have to use it. But as I said, there could be a scenario. Winters are coming. Another surge is expected. We don't know what's going to happen. And if all your RRT equipment and consumables are occupied, there might be a point when a child requires RRT and then to a decision to withhold that life-sustaining treatment from a child might be very, very difficult. Similarly, if you want to reverse triage and to withhold RRT from one patient to maximize the opportunity for the other, that requires a lot of ethical considerations and ethical support. And, and institutes in the Western world do have the ethical committees, which might be helpful in these situations. So what about the challenges? The challenges are due to the disease itself. It's hyperinflammatory, it's procoagulant. We have got limited resources and we very rapidly need to adapt to unfamiliar techniques, unfamiliar staffing, and there is increased level of, st of stress at the bedside, whether it's emotional, whether it is physical, and to do with, am I gonna take COVID back home? So it's, sim it's a thing which any human being will think. So lots of stress there. You need to be prepared to change your plans quickly. And we are still expected, despite the pandemic, despite reworking what we are doing, to be able to rapidly educate, do audit and research. So all of these are the challenges which we face during a pandemic. And what do we do? I think it's the teamwork. You really need to collaborate with your nephrology colleagues, with pediatrics and adults. How do they work together well? And how, what can adults do to help kids? And what can kids do to help adults? And at King's, very, very proudly, I can say that we set up a hybrid unit. Our unit had both children and adults on the same unit. You had a two kilo child with neonatal hemochromatosis on CRRT on bed one, and you had a hundred kilo adult with, with about hundred comorbidities on bed two. So you need to really collaborate and you need to have your patient selection. You need to decide for yourself, what is my threshold to start CRRT or RRT in any particular patient? This is, I'm just going to talk next two, three slides. Uh, my colleague Richard Fisher has very kindly lent me his slides. So this is, these were the problems we had. As I said, we, there were more patients than we usually care for. A number of them required RRT. When I talked to Richard, he told me about 80% of patients in critical care ended up with API. And of these 80%, 62% required renal replacement. It's a huge number. At one point in time, we had more than 50 patients requiring renal replacement therapy. We didn't have enough machines. Our article zoomables were not there. Now, since it was a global problem and not a king specific problem, it was very difficult to go out and seek help because everybody was facing the same problem. What did we do? We rationalized the use of RRT. We had stricter starting criteria than we might otherwise have. We borrowed machines, PICU lent them, renal rent them. When there were adequate consumables but a critical shortage of machines, we rotated the machines, used alternate methods of RRT like PD, we adjusted the dialysate and replacement fluid ratios using the lowest possible exchange rate. And as I said, it was the full anticoagulation to prevent filter clotting, which helped us as well. So this was the pandemic going on March through to April. And you can see here, we started doing PD here. The orange, bar, the orange bars are your CRRTs. And you can see that rapidly your dependence on CRRT is actually coming down. So this was the first PD here. And this is 100% patients on CRRT and see that nicely the number of patients who required CRRT came down because we started to use acute peritoneal dialysis in patients who were in critical care. 35 patients received PD on ICU and that was the, that remained the sole modality in 77.4% of the bed days. We didn't have to, what I'm, what I'm trying to say is we didn't feel that PD failed or PD didn't work, and that's why we had to resort to another modality. So it was a huge team effort at King's. There was a tactical team leader. The tactical team leader would go around to all the ICUs, make sure the equipment, the staffing, the consumables, and the morale of the, of, of the staffing is good. And we worked in a really, really collaborative way with our pharmacy, with the hematology, interventional radiology. So at every step, everybody was in the loop. And there were daily, twice a day meetings in the morning and evenings to make sure that everybody is on the same page. So in summary, there is no universal plan. Circumstances change very quickly. What it is, what I have adequate today might very rapidly become inadequate the next day. Guidelines do suggest standard RRT, but there is frequent clotting and clogging. There's limited resources and we have to adapt to alternate methods. 
and the weapons, as I've already, already mentioned, is the teamwork, the knowledge, the resilience, and very importantly, you need to be prepared and be flexible to adapt to the, to the new normal. Now, my last few slides on the cytosol, and this is a cytos this is a kind of a modality where adsorption onto, onto the filter fibers is, is the mechanism rather than filtration or diffusion. It takes care of inflammatory mediators like the cytokines, IL-6, IL-8, and this can be used both. If you can see, this is your cytosol, this is your filter. It's used in the pre-dialysis thing, pre-filter. -pre and here is the post filter. Here's your filter and here is the cytosol. So you don't have to interrupt your CRRT. You can actually put in a cartridge of cytosol and that can, that, that can do the job. And what it very nicely shows is the reduction of ferritin. Ferritin nicely comes down and your nicely IL-6 comes down. So that is what is the cause, as you know, of a lot of problems in COVID. So COVID-19 experience can definitely be extrapolated. And this is the surviving sepsis guidelines of adults. And they have said that if you have got really high levels of, of, uh, of uh, cytokines and interleukins, you definitely can use, but again, you need to be experienced to use it. There has to be support. And, and uh, I mean to say, you just, we just cannot plug this cartridge in and expect it to do wonders if our nursing and the medical staff are not geared to do it. And this is just explaining that as your IL-6s are going up, your AIDS and your multi-organ failure is going up. So direct correlation between the amount or, or the levels of, of, of interleukin-6 and the severity of illness, you can see here as well. And this is a cytokine storm scenario. And we can definitely ameliorate that by using cytosob with CRRT. So this is a slide which again shows how your IL-6 and how your ferritins are nicely coming down with the use of cytosorb. And if we use monoclonal antibodies, it can have a synergistic effect with cytosorb. So cytosorb along with, and, uh, along with your monoclonal antibodies can be synergistic. So in conclusion, for the cytosorbent therapy, it's a useful adjunct, but we would only use this modality in exceptional or compassionate grounds on a case-by-case -case basis or in research circumstances. I would like to thank my colleagues, Marlis Osterman from Essicum, Richard Fisher from King's and Zachariah Ritchie and Gabriella Batari, who very kindly lent me some of their slides. And this is just hot off press published yesterday. This is our review from Esthenic looking at acute kidney injury and special considerations of renal replacement therapy during the pandemic. Thank you. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Akash, for this wonderful talk and uh, enlightening us with, with your experiences uh, at King's College. Um, there are a few questions. I think, yes, I, I would give it to Dr. Sidra first to, yeah, to sure. ask the questions, and then I, would, I have a few things to ask as well. Thank you, Dr. Akash. Um, I think it was an exhaustive review of a topic that could possibly not have been covered in an hour. So, um, so um, thank you for being with us. And uh, we'll start off with a few questions that we have from the audience. Okay. So the first question is like you very rightly mentioned, you know, you need to... Um, rush, uh, you know, rush in your stuff, basically in resource limited settings. So how do you go about patient selection, especially if you're talking about, so this is like a very broad category, but any specific, like, you know, if you were to tell us like three things, you know, you would probably go for, you know, when to initiate CRRT in a resource limited setting. Yeah. So I think the first thing I would say is fluid overload in a setting of a patient who has got respiratory failure. So you have tried fluid restriction, you've tried dry diuretics, you're not winning. And that's the time I would definitely think of CRRT because that has got an impact on the overall physiology of the patient. So fluid overload, which is resistant to your medical management, is an indication for starting CRRT. RRT, CRRT, as I said, I've completely lost my plot over the last two months because I always used to use the word CRRT. But now because we are using PDs and IHTs, so things have become different. But yes, if you have got uh, yeah, fluid overload, I would say if you have got electrolyte disturbances, which could be life-threatening, hyperkalemia. So the, the conventional things come here now because 
Previously, we used to say, don't let the complications develop. But now the problem is if you're monitoring your patients closely, that's the only option you have. And, and the third, of course, is your, it's your uh, azotemia, because you don't want, because they're all in the setting of high u urea and creatinine, that, that in itself are prothrombotic. So you're gonna create your vicious cycle. So I would say three indications would be fluid overload resistant to your, your medical treatment, your acid base imbalance leading to life threatening hyperkalemias, and third is your azotemia, which is not getting controlled by your conventional methods, i.e., nephrotoxin exposure limitation, fluid management. So that, that would be the three. I think that is very well elaborated and a point that's well taken. Um, Dr. Shuz, would you like to go ahead? Yes, and uh, there's one question I have definitely uh, the uh, patients that we have had at uh, Arafan Hospital were mostly the pre-renal kind of a hit when COVID and they recovered within 72 hours and their creatinines came down and they started making urine. But my question is like, you know, as, as a part of early screening, some of our patients got the uh, renal screening because of the history that they had or the presentation. But as a part of a protocol, I would say, in case if we need to make it for future references, uh, is there a role of early proteinuria and hematuria in screening for COVID patients in, in pediatrics? Absolutely, yes. So a lot of patients, because as I explained, that the virus can actually attack your proximal tubule cells, tubular cells. So there is, if you look at this paper from, from, uh, from China and from Great Ormond Street as well, unfortunately, because as I said, it's, there are so many patients, people have not done it all the patients with proteinuria and hematuria, and the resolution of that actually indicates AKI has set in or AKI is resolving. So absolutely, I would, if I have to make a list, I would say screen for urine, looking for hematuria, micro, uh, hematuria, proteinuria, do an ultrasound uh, there. And then when the patient is getting discharged at that point in time as well, I would definitely look for urine and I'd definitely look for blood pressure because that's your baseline. And what we are very, we are not very good at doing, we are not following our acute kidney injury patients very well. So we are saying creatinine is normal, urine is normal, they're fine. But actually, what they need is a three month to six month follow up as you would normally do in your nephrology clinics, looking at their blood pressures, checking their urine. So their long term follow up is also very essential. So absolutely to answer your question. Yes, protein urea. Yes, hematuria. Yes, ultrasound. They need to be done. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, do you have another question? Oh, you want to take the questions? Uh, no, I have I another question. Yeah. Okay, so another question that we have, Dr. Akash, from um, one of our nephrology colleagues here. And the question is, so what are your comments on continuous flow peritoneal dialysis? Um, is there a role in AKI in general versus patients with COVID? So I would say... I mean, say yes, you, as you know that the, the, the continuous flow PD is a very good device when you put enter into one and the flow through the other, but lesser interventions in a COVID, because you're, we are limited, and if you're proning the patient, they become very difficult if you have catheters on both the sides. I think uh, technically it might not be feasible, but of course, if you're getting frequent catheter blocks, that, that is something where you, what you do in a non-COVID patient. But in a COVID patient, I would slightly be a bit wary because if they have got AIDS as well and you're proning and doing all that, that will limit. So yeah, that's my, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't use it as my first choice of, uh, of, of peritone dialysis. All right, thank you. And another question from my end is that, you know, a lot of these patients are coming in with a lot of respiratory distress and they end up getting intubated. So does time to intubation actually dictate um, time to initiation of CRRT? How has your experience been? It's a very good question. So the New York experience, as I said, their mean, the, I mean, say the, the median uh, timing from intubation to initiation of CRRT, you will be surprised, is 0.3 hours. So they were probably into AKI as they were about to intubate. And actually, they, they put in the VASCAT at the same time as they were intubating as well. So the so 50%, as I said, of the patients who developed, who were ventilated and required CRRT, they did, 50% of them did it in the first 24 hours. So patients who are requiring mechanical ventilation are developing AKI and requiring RRT within 24 hours. 
So it's probably the multi-organ dysfunction that's set in from the word go. So yeah, the earlier absolutely. you initiate, the better. Yes. And you know, that's, that's the same thing we could say for our acute liver failure patients, the same thing we say, right? It's going to happen. So I mean, say if we are in a, in a multi-organ failure state in COVID, and we know patients might get fluid overloaded, I think it's not a bad idea because you will limit the number of exposures to your healthcare staff. You're intubating the patient. You put the VASCAT in the same time. You might not need it. You can use the VASCAT for as a central line later on, but then you might prevent yourself from going in again and, and, and you know, doing all that stuff. So I think it's, it's just thinking about things in advance to say, I might need it. Let me just prepare for it. I might not need it. I might not use it as a, as, as a dialysis catheter. I might use it as a central line. Totally. Okay. Just a quick question about peritoneal dialysis uh, uh, in a res resource limited setting. Uh, so, what would you recommend? The starting strength of solution, PD solution, uh, for our patient. I saw your slide. You mentioned 2.5, and then escalating to higher strengths. But uh, um, if we, uh, the, is there any limitation in between the two strengths, or is, uh, what would you recommend? I think again, it will depend upon what. For example, the PD fluids in UK are very different to the. PD fluids in Africa to very different PD fluids in Pakistan and India. So I would say whatever you have, use that. And if you have to go up, you can, as you know, you can add dextrose to make it more concentrated. But again, again, you, we have recommended or we think 2.5 is to begin with. And then you can go up. If you can make 3.5, yes, go for 3.5. It's based on your local resources. Thank you. I think we have another seven minutes to take probably yeah, two more questions. That's okay, fine. so um, with regards to anticoagulation, I think that was a very important uh, point that came out in your presentations. A lot of these patients with COVID would actually be on a low molecular weight um, enoxaparin, right, heparin. So um, if we were to anticoagulate them, so what should be the choice? Should we continue with the low molecular weight only or could we use a combination of the low molecular weight versus the routine heparin infusion? Uh, what are the suggestions and take on that? So when you're using enoxaparin or clexane or whatever you call it for prophylaxis, probably your dose are prophylactic doses, right? So first of all, I think if you're using and you don't want to kind of uh, make it more complicated, you make it, you go to therapeutic doses of low molecular weight. Heparin. And you see that your filters are still clotting. So what you could do is, because as I said, it's the, the last thing you want is to start using any anticoagulant which you have not used before in this pandemic, right? So you then might want to start on a infusion of unfractionated heparin as uh, on pre-filter. You can use it okay. pre-filter into the circuit along with low molecular weight heparin, right? And I'm, I have not shown you that slide, but even the unfractionated heparin can be monitored by NT10A levels. So you don't have to do ACTs and NT10A levels. Your NT10A levels are good enough for both unfractionated heparin and for low molecular weight heparin. You could do that. Now, if you ask me, which is, why do I keep harping about prostacycline? I think it is the easiest anticoagulant to use. You don't have to monitor, you're monitoring just your filter lives and your bleeding and hypertension, right? If you have got bleeding, a bleeding, I have not seen life-threatening bleed or even small bleeds in patients who are on, on prostacycline. It just goes pre-filter, you start at four to eight nanograms per kilo per minute, very easy to make. The, the, the protocol is actually there on, on uh, pcrrt.com website. And, and as I said, you don't have to do any, any miraculous or any complicated uh, monitoring device. If you have got uh, a tag or a rotum to just monitor your, your, your thromboelastogram, you could do that once in a day, but it's very, very easy to use. And a combination of prostacycline and unfractionated heparin absolutely does wonders. And because it has got a heparin sparing effect as well. So what effect you are getting at 20 units per kilo per hour, now you are getting at 10 units per kilo per hour by using a combination of prostacycline and heparin, and you can reduce the side effects of heparin as well. Well, that's interesting. And have you had the experience of using an oxaparin as an infusion? No, no I've not had the experience. There is a paper in intensive care medicine, which have, they have used it, but again, it's the same as your, as your, what do you call it, unfractionated heparin, all different, you have to monitor NT10A levels rather than the ACTs. Right. So another question I think that's um, 
if we were to have another three hours to answer this is like, how do you achieve an optimal fluid balance? Like we're talking about patients who are dehydrated in a pre-renal state when they land in, and then we're talking about fluid overload and ARDS. So uh, while initiating the CRRT, we, you are ensuring, you mentioned in one of your slides, it has to be euvolemic state. So how do we go about ensuring that? So again, for example, I'll tell you what, what you need to use a combination of your clinical cues. I mean to say, first of all, an awareness that every patient who comes to you hypertensive doesn't require fluids. That's the first thing people need to remember, that not everything is fluid depletion. So what we, you, we used to look at the guidelines and say 60 mils per kilo of fluid is required, 20, 20, 20, and we gave it. I think the, the absolute principle is you give one fluid bolus and look for the response. Has my patient responded to it? Does my patient need more fluid? Whether the heart rate has come down, look at the liver. I'm talking just clinical cues. In my center, in addition to clinical cues, you can either do an echocardiography or you can, I use ASCOP, the ultrasound cardiac output monitoring, very, very easy to use. And you can say, right, before I started giving the fluid bolus, I had a uh, 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 SVR of whatever of X, and now it has gone up. The, the stroke volume has gone up by 10% more. It means the patient responded. The heart rate had come down, the blood pressure had gone up, and the stroke volume index went up. So it's a combination of this. So the, the main thing is make sure you know that the patient has responded or not responded to your fluid bolus, and does your patient need more fluid? Once you've answered these questions, and if your patient doesn't require more fluid, which is fine, the heart might not be, might, might not be great enough and has gone on the curve of the Frank Starling, you might want to start early inotropes and then put your patient on CRR. I think those are very, very well elaborated points. So um, one last question. Um, we may take, yeah. Okay, so does elevated creatinine correlate with the hyperinflammatory response? Because we know that creatinine, even though it may be a good marker, but maybe unreliable, you know, in cases of inflammation, a lot of times has to do with muscle mass. So uh, is there like a better biomarker that we could possibly use? Or is, or is there any research on that? Or do we just stick to creatinine, creatinine therapy? I wish we had, all of us had the resources to do it. Like, for example, there is a very a good review and a paper come out only last week on the use of NGAL. Looking at, you know, if we all had it, I think NGAL is a very good marker of tubular damage. So if you do a urinary NGAL, so we are going to start this looking at our, our liver failure patients, for example, when we are confused between pre-renal, hepatorenal, and all that stuff. That's a very good marker. Similarly here as well, you look at NGAL, and I am very happy if anybody wants to collaborate on, on any of these aspects. And I want you to actually say that at our critical care nephrology section of ESTNIC is, is literally looking for global collaboration. So if any one of you want to get involved from pediatric nephrology or intensive care into, in, into, our, into our projects, please feel free to contact me. But to answer your question on, on um, biomarkers, I think NGAL or tubular ma uh, damage markers are the way to go. So once again, Dr. Akash, um, thank you so much. And I think it was a brilliant hour. We were, we were a little over an hour, but I think we learned so much today. And uh, it, the talk was fantastic. You almost tried to cover all, all aspects of AKI possibly that, that could have been covered in an hour. And we look forward to seeing you again. Thank, Thank you, you so much. And I have to say that, you know, this was a, a visit, but it's virtual, but it was, long, it was long pending. It's very nice to see you guys. You know, as I said, I want you to come here a couple of times, but never materialize. And I hope in the next couple of years, I should be physically with you. Thank you. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That is what we would look forward to. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks Thank everyone. you. Take bye -bye. care and good evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So tomorrow, join us uh, for the last session at the Conversations. And we'll be having Professor Michael Levin with us. He happens to be a professor of pediatrics at the Imperial College of the United Kingdom. And he'll be sharing his thoughts on multi-system inflammatory syndrome in uh, COVID-19. So thank you all for joining us today. Take care and good evening.